Good evening, everyone. My name is Santiago Perez. I'm an applications engineer at Silicon Labs, and it's a pleasure to be here. The agenda for today, uh, uh, the presentation kind of breaks down into two parts. One, uh, I'll talk a little about me, about Silicon Labs, and about applications engineering, which is the field that I work in. Second half, we'll go uh, a little into what IoT is and wireless protocols. If you have heard that before or not, uh, we'll, we'll cover it. And then we'll be having a demo that's going to be uh, covered by my colleague, Junasa Alam. <coughs> He's also an applications engineer at Silicon Labs. So um, this presentation is pretty uh, high level, brief, if you are interested in more detail or if you have any questions as we go along with this. <coughs> so a little about myself, I grew up in the U.S.-Mexico border, El Paso, Juarez. I have undergrad and graduate degrees in electrical engineering. Um, I, was, I was a student at UTEP and Texas a and Texas El Paso. I'm an applications engineer at Silicon Labs. I've been there for the last three years. Uh, to show my human side, because people tend to think that engineers are just these nerds. <laughs> uh, I have a 10 year old daughter. Uh, she keeps me pretty busy. I have some hobbies. I play volleyball. Uh, I like to play guitar. I like cooking. I like exercising. And I'm um, pretty happy and grateful with my life. So I like to enjoy it. So uh, if you wonder how I got to being an applications engineer, this is kind of my career in a nutshell. Uh, I grew up in Mexico, so uh, in Mexico I was a high school dropout, not by choice, but because I came from uh, some rough socioeconomic background that at some point I had to give up school because uh, we couldn't afford to pay for it. So that, the good thing was that I learned, it taught me to appreciate uh, education. So then you'll see how that comes into play in the rest. Uh, at some point, uh, once my family and I were here in the U.S., I, uh, I was in high school and I was trying to uh, figure out what I wanted to study. So I caused an apartment blackout at home that if you want to hear the details, we can cover that. <laughs> but uh, that's what got me started into uh, thinking about electrical engineering, which is a major that I picked uh, for my undergrad. Uh, when I was in college, I did internships, I got involved in student organizations, so I started <laughs> seeing companies, talking to people, anyhow, that was fun. And then I got to graduate in a really bad year where uh, nobody was really hiring, the economy was bad for engineers, so that kind of put me on the track to grad school. Uh, I stayed in a master's program and when I got to the master's program I was fortunate to get a full fellowship to take care of the master's program funded by the National Science Foundation. But the catch was that I had to go for more grad school. I had to uh, pursue a doctoral degree, which sounded fun at the beginning. <laughs> so we have some doctors here that will probably know more about this. Anyhow, I, uh, I was pursuing doctoral studies at a and in analog and RF uh, IC design, which stands for integrated circuit, which ties to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the two really cool things about the PhD was that I was doing research in something that I was interested in. And at some point, because of a uh, funds shortage, I had to go into teaching, and I realized that I really enjoyed uh, teaching. Uh, I worked as a TA for the electrical engineering department. And at some point, I got a fellowship um, sponsored by the National Science Foundation uh, for something called GK through 12 program. I don't know if any of you have heard, but they hire uh, engineers, scientists, they take them into the classroom to uh, interact with students and teachers. And that turned out to be a lot of fun, so when I heard about this opportunity today, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> So at some point, I got ready, went on the job hunt, had to study really hard, prepare a lot, uh, get ready for interviews, and eventually I landed a position at Silicon Labs as a uh, new college grad applications engineer. There's a difference between your entry-level positions and positions that require a lot of experience. So I went through an entry-level position, that's what NCG stands for, new college grad. <laughs> A little about Silicon Labs. Uh, Silicon Labs is uh, located in downtown. If you are familiar, we're right next to the city hall, the two buildings uh, across the river. Uh, we're a global mixed signal semiconductor company. We were founded in 1996, and uh, we became a publicly traded company since 2000. 
Um, we have about 1,100 employees worldwide, and uh, we have research and development locations uh, across the world, Norway, Finland, uh, the U.S., Singapore, China. Uh, the company has done well, uh, keeps a strong track of innovation and differentiation. Uh, what I want to point out about this is that we are a fabulous <coughs> company. What that means is we make, or we design circuit, integrated circuits, but we don't fabricate them. So, so what I'm uh, going to show you here, this is a silicon wafer with uh, a lot of copies of the same circuit over and over. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's on a motion sensor. So I'm going to pass one out so that you all can look at it, but basically we design whatever gets built on these. Eventually we get back the wafers and every little copy of the circuit gets cut out in something that looks like this, which I'm also going to pass out. Eventually each little copy of that circuit gets uh, packaged, which is another thing that I'm going to pass out here. And eventually each of these little packaged devices, after testing and after we know that they work, eventually end up in a circuit of, I don't know, a higher level system, something that might go into a TV or a computer or a cell phone or who knows. So I'm going to start passing this out here. And, uh, I would appreciate it if you don't drop the wafer. <laughs> <laughs> that one uh, will break like glass. So, we pass this out. I don't know. Who has this out? It's quiz prices. So, uh, oh. so, Silicon Labs, as I mentioned, uh, makes integrated circuits uh, that go into different applications. Uh, our company breaks down into four different uh, business divisions at the high level. One is what we call the Internet of Things. I'll talk a little about that. Uh, something else we call infrastructure, automotive and consumer, and boys and dad. Uh, so that we don't burn a lot of time on these, uh, I'll just focus on Internet of Things towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so. Jonas and I are applications engineers, and uh, if you wonder what an application engineer does, uh, we provide engineering and technical support to internal and customer design teams for the development, the deployment, and the support of products. So for us, each of those little chips is a product. Uh, that product at some point is being designed, we're getting some different versions of the chip to make sure that it works, so that would be the development stage. Then you have the part where we know that the product is good, that is ready for the market, so there's another stage there that involves work for us. And then at the end of that product makes it out to the market and is successful and a lot of people or companies are buying it, then that's the third stage, supporting a product that's already out there. So um, the functions of an application engineer, applications engineer based on that product stage, if we go to the under development <coughs> section of the product, uh, we design and debug test boards. So uh, something like the board that I'm going to pass out here. We end up making these monster boards with a lot of connectors and who knows what. So we can test the devices and make sure that they do what they're supposed to. So here's a sample. Uh, we also uh, support the validation of the design. Whoever designed that thing wants to make sure that this works the way it's intended. So we help to test, we help to collect data. Uh, we set up the benches, we have to get equipment, put everything together in the lab, etc. Uh, we do competitive analysis, if we're doing a, a product that other companies also have, a uh, similar product, we have to look at how our company is looking, compare our performance. So then uh, you also have, once the product is ready for market release, our work involves uh, developing what I'll call product collateral. So what, at the end, what we are selling is just the tiny little chip. But uh, for anybody to come and get that chip, they need to have a board for them to test. So we come up with what we call a development kit. Uh, all the software that goes along with that so that they can program our products, they can put it up and, and get it running. Uh, we, do, uh, we support our marketing team as they're starting to get ready to put this out and we start selling. We uh, write user guides and applications notes for this product. 
uh, we become experts at this product. Because then we go to the third stage, which is once the product is out in the market. Hopefully the product uh, does really well, starts selling, a lot of customers start buying it. So uh, we have to provide technical support. Uh, if a customer has questions about the product, then we have to be there and helping uh, solve their questions, helping uh, put their system together, etc. So that's what an applications engineer does. Uh, at the very end, we're helping customers. We're, uh, we're an important uh, branch within the company that helps to keep that revenue coming because uh, depending on how good of a job we do helping support customers, the customers will buy our product and that's good for us. If they don't buy it, that's not good for us. Um, so what do you need to be an applications engineer? Uh, for our company and in our particular area, you need a degree in electrical engineering because that's what we do, this is all related to electrical engineering. Uh, you need a broad set of technical skills because you're doing so many different things. Uh, you need to have uh, knowledge of electronics, uh, micro uh, controllers, circuit design, uh, board layout, lab equipment, programming, etc. So all this comes through uh, an electrical engineering program, general, or at least they touch on all that. Uh, you need to have good soft skills. You have to be able to communicate well because you're interacting with so many people. Uh, you need to have a good teamwork ethic. You can't be selfish and you have to you know, work as hard as everyone else. Uh, you have to be able to adapt to change, which uh, this is something that some people don't like. Things change and they have to come out of their comfort zone. Their project got, I don't know, changed in a weird way. They don't like it. Uh, and your writing skills, which goes back to the comment that he was making. Uh, writing is really important because uh, what you communicate to your customers, for example, in your app notes, it's easy to read, it's I mean, something simple to follow. The number of questions that you're going to be getting about the product are going to be much less than if it's confusing. Or... In addition to that, well, you need to be a hard worker and you have to be committed to what you're doing. And uh, you need to have a system level way of thinking because since you are looking at things that relate to business, to the design of the product, to uh, applications, to customer support, so that's that's what's required. So that kind of covers the first part of the presentation. Any questions, anybody? Pretty simple, no? So now uh, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things, and this is going to lead into our demo. Um, Internet of Things, or IoT, uh, for our company, it's a business branch that involves the uh, application of microcontrollers, wireless communication, and sensors, and I'll explain why. Uh, if you go online and just do a search for IoT, because that's kind of a hot topic right now in the industry, but a lot of people or companies define it in different ways. Uh, your typical web search is going to say, IoT is a proposed development of the internet in which everyday <laughs> objects have network connectivity, allowing them to send and receive data. So what you have to keep in mind is that at some point, you had computers, right? And computers started talking to each other, and then they built the internet. At some point, then you started getting mobile devices, your smartphones that somehow started also networking, you have your cellular networks, and then those started also have connecting to the backbone of the internet. So now we're talking about uh, objects, everyday objects, uh, appliances, wearables, things that are also going to be somehow connecting to the internet. So that's where the term Internet of Things comes from. Uh, a Wikipedia definition of the same term is just going to tell you it's a network of physical objects, devices, vehicles, buildings, and any other items which are embedded with electronics, software, sensors, and network connectivity. So notice those four things, electronics, software, sensors, and connectivity. Um, as far as Silicon Labs, we claim that leading providers of IoT devices rely on our solutions to deliver products that change lives and transform industries. Uh, some of the IoT applications that you start seeing now, where some of our products are, are included, are wearables, if you have a Fitbit, for example. Uh, smart buildings or connected homes, if you have a Nest uh, thermostat at home, uh, smart metering, smart factories, uh, the products that 
we uh, provide or as IoT solutions are going into those applications. So again, for the uh, IoT, our solutions include sensing, and our company makes uh, heart rate <coughs> monitor sensors, infrared sensors, ambient and ultraviolet light, etc. So we have a, a good portfolio of sensors. Uh, as far as electronics, well, that involves more uh, the computing parts. And uh, so we make microcontrollers that are very powerful. Uh, for connectivity, we support uh, multiple wireless communication protocols to our products, which I'm going to talk about, and they're going to lead into our demo. And the tools are also something that's very important. The software that we provide to customers to be able to use our products and make them user friendly. So we have all that in our portfolio. So I was mentioning uh, connectivity. The Internet of Things is going to rely on wireless connectivity to add all these additional objects to the network. And uh, right now, uh, you might have heard about Wi Fi, about Bluetooth, about Zigbee, about Thread. These are all different wireless communication standards. What you have to keep in mind is that the difference between all of them is one, the data throughput. How much information do you want to send in that connection? Two, the range. How far do you need to send this information? Do you want your wireless communication to be short range from here to this table? Do you want it from here to the backyard? Who knows? So that makes a difference in the design of the network. Also, how many devices do you want to be able to connect? That makes a difference. Do you just need to have one guy or one master device connected to a slave device? Or do you need to have what we call a mesh? where there's a lot of different devices connected all together and then at the end a single node connected to the internet. So you have different wireless communication protocols for each of these things. Uh, Wi-Fi, you can think of it as a big pipe that allows you to send a high data rate, connects you to the cloud, right? At home you have your Wi-Fi router. Uh, if we talk about Zigbee or Thread, uh, you have uh, more of a low data rate, low power, communication going on, shorter range, so you will see that applied in, in your home. And Bluetooth, there's a variant that's called Bluetooth Smart, which is what we're going into, but Bluetooth is more for point to point. And let me talk about Bluetooth a little. Bluetooth is a wireless communication technology that was initially developed by a company called Ericsson in 1994. Uh, the name Bluetooth comes from a 10th century Danish king, apparently, whose last name translates to Bluetooth in English. And the big thing about this is that um, you have a lot of different wireless protocols. You have a lot of companies that are pushing their solution to, to win in the market. So uh, this is a, I don't know, a royal rumble sometimes, a lot of companies and products fighting. So this particular standard came to unify a lot of companies, uh, a lot of the rules that were being put in place for a short-range communication. Uh, Bluetooth is standardized. This is this followed by a standard that is maintained by a group called the Special Interest Group, Bluetooth SIG. Bluetooth is really popular because uh, from the beginning it was made royalty-free for all the members of that SIG. So that makes a big difference if you have to pay for your product to support that versus it's available as long as you register for this uh, organization. Bluetooth uses the unlicensed 2.4 gigahertz frequency band. Uh, if you've ever heard about the FCC and Spectrum, anybody that wants to broadcast any information wirelessly out there, uh, you have to send these this information in using electromagnetic waves of a certain frequency and so there's a particular band at 2.4 gigahertz that is pretty much free for everyone to use. You don't have to be paying royalty to use that band. So that's why it's so popular. And this is globally. So anywhere in the world it's it's available. Uh, Bluetooth has native support mobile phone operating systems. So any mobile phone will support Bluetooth. And uh, because it's become popular for all those reasons you start selling more and more devices that are uh, supporting Bluetooth, so that means higher device volume, and that brings down the cost. So then that makes it even easier to, to make it popular, right? Because now you can get it for cheaper. 
Within Bluetooth, there are different variations or different uh, branches. There's one in particular that's going to be, or that is actually already critical for the Internet of Things. That's referred to as Bluetooth Low Energy. And Bluetooth Low Energy is intended for low power applications that are going to run from coin cell batteries. So when you're talking about wanting to have wireless communication and processing power and all this, well, if you have a, if you can connect this thing to the wall or if you have a big battery, great. But now you're trying to do all this running from a small coin cell battery so that if you put a, a sensor node somewhere in your house with the battery, that thing stays there for years and you don't have to even think about it right until the battery uh, runs out in a very long time. So this particular version of Bluetooth is going to be uh, important for that. Uh, the thing is, Bluetooth Low Energy is good for sending small amounts of data infrequently. So if you happen to have a Bluetooth speaker or something at home that uses Bluetooth, that particular version of Bluetooth is probably the high data throughput that requires more energy to run. So that's different from Bluetooth Low Energy. Keep that in mind. Um, out there in the technical world, that brand of, or that branch of Bluetooth is called Bluetooth Low Energy. But for marketing purposes, that's referred to as Bluetooth Smart. So if you ever hear out there Bluetooth Smart, Bluetooth Low Energy, they're the same thing. Just keep that in mind. And some products are designed to support both older version of Bluetooth, Bluetooth and uh, low energy, or just uh, low energy. The last thing is that, uh, well, if you have wireless communication and processing and all that, then how can you talk about low energy, right? This thing's trying to get information. So the key thing is that devices that use this wireless protocol, what they do is that they are basically switching all the time between an active state and a sleep state. So this right here is a curve of the current consumption of a Bluetooth low energy device, where all these regions where you see those spikes, there's <coughs> activity going on, the device is transmitting information and they're ready to receive something. But then it, once it finishes, boom, it goes back to sleep and the current consumption drops. And uh, the, the connection interval is programmable, so you can make it, uh, I don't know, several seconds. And that's how you end up getting that long battery life. Because your device can go to sleep and burns uh, minimal power. If it's on, it's just uh, transmitting very quickly. So, with that said, we have a very nice demo here by Yunas. I'll let him take over. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, I'm also an applications engineer. Most of the work that I do in my group uh, is developing design and customer support. So, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little about myself. Um, as you mentioned, engineers are also humans. <laughs> so, I grew up in Pakistan. I finished my high school there and then moved to the US for my undergrad. And after completing my undergrad, during my undergrad, I also interned at Silicon Labs. That's how I got to know more of the people and about the group that I joined. So once I graduated, I just came straight to here in Texas. I'm originally from Illinois. My hobbies include, I like a lot of sports, playing, watching, for example, soccer. Um, soccer is really popular in Pakistan as well. So. And tennis. <coughs> tennis because in the US there's a lot of, there was a lot of craze about tennis, especially the last US Open. A pretty big thing, especially the And I like traveling. I really like to learn about the culture and history of different places. So, like how people were there and how they, like how they got there and like what led them to the different like their lifestyle. So, I really like understanding that. Um, the demo I have today is built upon what Alfredo was talking about. IoT. So I can probably set this up. <coughs> you know, you know, yes. So he's going to put his uh, smartphone on his smartphone because I have an app on the phone. Do you want to give him a quick breakdown of what this oh, yeah. is? Yeah. So, that he can... so I, I guess that's before starting the demo. So what, what I have here. 
a device that has this sort of long sensor sticking out. And what this sensor does is it basically detects the amount of water that there is within soil. So this helps like anyone who has plants at home. You can just stick some of these sensors in your plants and you don't have to worry about going and checking how much water there is. The sensor will basically transmit that information through Bluetooth. So it covers all parts of IoT. It has the sensor. It has a uh, Bluetooth module in there that's doing all the computation. It's calculating how much water there is based off the information <coughs> the sensor is giving. And then it transmits that out to your, your cell phone. And the way this transmits it out is that anyone can look at that information and you can have multiple sensors and they can all be translating at the same time. So if you have multiple plants, you don't have to worry about checking each one individually. You can just stick this in and you can have all that information. So I'm going to show the demo now. Um, so the way that the sensor works is it's basically, it's like a touch screen. Like most of us have cell phones where you, have, you touch it and it just works. But the way it does it is you have a screen that has some capacitance, right? So it's like a battery and right now it's like a small battery. So when you're charging and discharging it, it does it much faster because there's just a small amount of charge that you can store. So, but when you touch the screen with your finger, you're sort of like a large battery, sort of, because you have a lot of, you can store a lot of charge. And that difference in the capacitance that you generate makes the variation slower. And this is what the sensor detects. So right now it's seeing like at faster variations, and when you touch it, or when this is in water, it'll start slowing down. And that way you're your the microcontroller in there will tell that someone has touched it or that how much water there is based on the variation. So you have to calibrate it based on a lot of information from the outside, like is it humid outside? You don't want that to affect the readings that you're getting. But the basic principle is is very common across the cell phone. Like a lot of people use it but now you'll know about it as well. So I'll move on to the demo. <laughs> so what he's doing right now is uh, bringing up uh, an app on his phone that's going to be able to pick up that uh, Bluetooth beacon that's being sent by the sensor as he sticks it in the water. So you could put this in the soil, like in your flower pot or something like that, and it would just constantly tell you, like, I'm going to have more water over. Yeah. So do they use this commercially in farming? They yeah. do. Um, there's two ways of doing this. Um, there's this capacitance, and then there's one in which they pass a current through the soil and see how much resistance. The more water you have, the, more, the less resistance you get, and that's another way of doing it. But they're both readily available and used. I think the principle is the sensor that is using, it's, uh, it's detecting capacitance. And the value of that capacitance that the sensor measures changes with with water. So uh, based on that change in capacitance, with the processing that is doing in the module and whatever algorithm is using that translates to a number, that the number then can be used to make a decision. So this number is here, then we need water. This number is too low or five. So is this like integrated into some kind of irrigation or, or sprinkler system, like for you know well, yards uh, or? I can comment on what uh, Unas does in his team at Silicon Labs. We have a team called uh, IoT Solutions. So they're actually coming up with reference designs with solutions where they are using all our IoT products and putting them together in, in final solutions. Uh, as far as I know, I think this is already this. Some of these things already have industrial application, mm -hmm. so uh, you can find companies that are buying our products to build similar things. 
One thing I didn't mention, uh, as part of applications engineering, sometimes a customer will come to you, they don't know how to do something, but they're willing to buy your product <coughs> in high volume, so you actually have to come up with a solution for them to use your product. Yeah. So this is a, a good thing to have, for example, in hand, reference designs to where if this high agro business comes and says they want to do this, what do we need to do? Well, here's the design, here's the product, this is what you do. We can take it from there. Lights off, I think. Lights off? Uh, on? Yeah. No, no, sorry. That's the light. Maybe even back here. Ah, there we go. Uh, so look at this number here. This is the number that's telling you how much. Uh, <laughs>
could have like, different parameters. Because this, is, this itself is not actually measuring the humidity, it's measuring the capacitance change caused by having water around it. So, we do have a humidity sensor. But actually did that thing with So, back to laptop. Just this is. It depends on how many you have built. You could probably get it. Like, Our products end up dropping in cost a lot, but at the uh, expectation that a company is going to buy high volume. So, for example, if you buy a hundred thousand little sensors, you get a certain price. If you want to buy ten, then sometimes what we do is. All these parts are available through uh, websites like DigiKey or Mouser. These are companies that actually sell uh, individual products by the piece, and you can buy them, but then there's a, a distributor there that's probably also adding a cost for, I don't know, keeping all this in their inventory and, and selling. And the, this sensor itself is not, um, it's, it's, it, it uses a basic concept of capacitance, it's not something that you can actually make it yourself if you know how to do some a little bit of piece of design. So the more important thing is the uh, the chip communicates that and senses that. So then, uh, with that being said, let's recap here. So I know this is one thing I learned working with teachers. You have to bring it closer at the end to your lesson. <laughs> so uh, what have we learned here today? What do we talk about? Volunteers, or should I start picking? Engineers are humans. Huh? Engineers are humans? Okay, that's a good one. Anybody else? How, how well prepared our students need to be? How what, I'm sorry? How well prepared uh, our students need to be? Our students need to be. Uh -huh. So, in the earlier presentation, we talked about how important math is, how important science is. Uh, we didn't go down to the level, but by saying you need to know electronics, you need to know programming, you need to know all this. Uh, basic foundation to be able to do all this is good math skills and um, your science. There's a lot. Anybody else? Going once? Yes? I learned what application engineers do. Mm -hmm. And I learned it from El Paso, I'm from Fabians. Oh, well, we're neighbors. <laughs> so I've been to Fabians. There's a really good steakhouse there. I yes, well, kind of out the. <laughs> uh, so, anything else? Going once, going twice, because then comes a quiz. Uh, the last thing we to mention is one of our colleagues has this uh, website called OS STEM, or STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. <coughs> and if you go to that website, you will find some links for different uh, companies locally that are doing uh, things to uh, get students or teachers involved, bring them to campus visits, uh, summer internship opportunities. So if you want to write that uh, address down, uh, at least I was told that for this coming summer, we are scheduling campus visits for teachers. So if you're interested in bringing a group of students, um, all you would need to do is go to the website, and there's uh, an address here. Teacher email form. We're going to pass the presentation out, right? To everybody or no? Yeah, I'll post it on the website so everyone will have access. So the information will be there, but you basically have to follow these instructions so that your name gets added to a, a database where the next time an email goes out announcing something, uh, you all can get it. But you also can go and check in and see what's there. I haven't checked it myself, to be honest. I just found out about this recently. But on that note, uh, thank you for having us. We had fun.